I would like to talk to you about a conversation I've been practicing, rehearsing and listening to people about all year, actually. And it's to do with emotion management in contact centers. And I will start off this conversation by saying, I know a number of you have already got some fabulous people in your contact centers who connect to customers and do a great job. What I'm talking about is, can we take that and move it on a little bit further? And I'll try and position this as why we need to be thinking about the next phase. And I think it dovetails very nicely into uh, what Dennis has been scene setting. Um, probably the only point saying I have been out there doing it, listening. This is all part of a sort of a, a, an ongoing conversation. I'd like to reiterate the point that, again, Dennis made early on in his presentation, that in a digital economy, which is one in which, as consumers, we are perfectly placed to be able to get whatever we want, any time, day or night, from anywhere. It's difficult to remember. In fact, there's a great stat I heard last week, which is 7,000 of us in the UK still watch black and white TV. How wild is that? I, I don't know where I'd even buy a set from, by the way. But, you know, this transformation we're talking about has got a very long tail to it. Some of us still choose to do that. The rest of us are already gearing up to be able to wear VR headsets and actually watch our TV in VR world. You know, <laughs> it's as crazy as that. And somewhere in between that is the majority of us. But in that world of perfect choice, the trouble is, how do you remain distinctive? You know, you go to business school, you do all your stuff, and you know that there's a couple of things you should compete on, price being one. We've had the, the, the lecture on that particular point. It's a, you know, race to the bottom. Also, product features, we all get over-obsessed with that. And yet, you know, effort, I can't be bothered to choose more than three colors. Why have we got 42 in the catalog? There's all that conversation. Distribution in a perfect world, you know, it's instant. It's out there. So it's very difficult to do that. Now, you know, you can go along to your skunk uh, works camp. You can go along your innovation center. You've got a nice little place happening down in Shoreditch somewhere. And you go and ideate, as you do these days. Yeah, you go and invent something new. You pop it out. It's working, 48 hours later, a competitor has imitated that. And the problem strategically is, how do you continue to look different? You get outpaced very easily at the end of the day. And that really is the major strategic concern that everybody's got. So on that basis, we have seen this growth in customer experience because the notion behind that is it's much more difficult to cut and paste human experience. You can't replicate and scale relationship. You can cheat in the way that Dennis was talking about, but you can't, the real deal is the real deal. You know, just access your own human experience of building relationships in your own life, and you know what it takes to do that stuff. So for a business, which is even more dystopian than you are as an individual, dyslexic, I should say, it's difficult to make those relationships actually work as a result of it. And that's what we've been doing 10 years. We've been trying to do that work. And if it's worth anything, because it has to be worth something commercially, it's about the fact that I, as a customer, am prepared to change my behavior towards you as a brand if you treat me in a certain kind of a way. You know, and it, it, it turns up money in the till. It turns up as, I will try something new from you. I will buy something more. I will do that over a longer period of time. I'll tell other people about it. And those are the specific behaviors that we are trying to connect in terms of the bigger thing called CX. We are not, because we're in business, being nice for the sake of it. Let's just be very clear about that point. And CX, by the way, and we belong to that bigger bubble, we do have to try to get outside of the trap called, you're only valuable if you're cheaper than you were last year. You know, there's two things we always did as call center managers. Up the experience, reduce the cost. By the way, you better know which one mattered most if you want your job next year. And the balance between those two things have always been very fine, as far as that's concerned. Now, if you're going to up the other side, the CX thing, you want to be about value creation, you need to evidence it. It's very easy to evidence a reduction of cost. We know the formula. We know the, you know, we know the game plan. We don't know the other side of the equation particularly well. That is the difficulty. But is there a connection between me being on a phone, influencing a customer, and eventually, clink, clink, it goes into the till? That's the formula that everyone needs to work up. Um, and, and luckily, there is some evidence to it. So, you know, gentlemen like this, it's interesting. A, he doesn't look like a CEO. He looks more like a guy who runs a rock band, which is kind of cool. 
And secondly, it comes up very strongly. This was a big piece of PR waving you know, earlier in the year. We ain't going to do the bot number on you. And particularly coming out of that US experience of technology-driven optimization, quite an interesting play at the end of the day. So why is he doing that? Is he just trying to get a PR? No, he's done his arithmetic. He's done his math. He knows exactly what he's talking about. And if you take an easy metric like NPS, you can have effort, you can have CSAT, really it doesn't matter too much. It's something that indicates where the customer is relative to their relationship with you. Then you can start to see some interesting trends. And the fact of the matter is a positive version of that score versus a, a lower version of that score correlates very tightly between the propensity of the customer to buy from you. So you can see that behavior. So that's the point at which you can start to interest the bean counters. Let's go back one level of behavior. And then this is the next important part of that uh, formula, which is how can you influence me in terms of being drawn towards you as a brand or being, ugh, I'm going to go somewhere else. And the fact of the matter is, all of the blue are positive emotions, such as excitement, appreciation, happy, confident, relieved. And all of the uh, orange, I don't think it's pineapple, I think it's orange for the sake of discussion. Uh, I, I think worried, relieved, confused, angry, frustrated. And the exam question was, you know, based on your previous interactions with a customer, what do you feel? Now, that is not profound you know, research in the sense of, gosh, I didn't know that, but it's nice to see it on a, on a chart. It's nice to see that evidenced, because you can see that connects to the previous point about money in the bank. And we're quite close now to the world called us in a contact center and provoking those experiences, either positive or negative. And we've got the beginnings of the formula, which is to do with value creation, as opposed to you need to be 30% cheaper or you ain't going to be here next year. So. Some of the more, you know, anecdotal stuff around of that behavior. Guess what? More of us feel good about brands if we have a positive emotional connection. Guess what? And I chose this particular example because the ombudsman ha really hasn't got an ax to grind. You know what I mean? They're just collecting the nation. How much is that money? I mean, that would pay for Brexit. Don't know where we're going to find it otherwise. But that's extraordinary. You know, we're prepared in a very busy world to actually go and move around. I heard a, a banking client said that his daughter already at the age of 18 has moved banks twice. I haven't got around to it yet. I'm of that generation. But you know, it's interesting. It's a habit that we get into. So positive emotion towards, negative emotion away from. What does good look like? A piece of Forrester research a couple of years back said the great ones deliver you 20, 28 great experiences only fall over once. The people that don't do it well fall over every other go. That's a good benchmark to think about. So my question is, do you know that? End of the week, do you know how many delivered in the positive versus the negative? Did you add to the goodwill index? Did you detract from it? It might have been the straw that broke the camel's back and they've walked, or it might just be part and parcel of. But unless you're measuring it, guess what? You can't improve it at the end of the day. So that's a very important, interesting indicator. So there's your background, if you want, the top-down version of life and why that's important. Now let's plug in why we should be doing it. And in essence, what I'm motivated about, because I am motivated to see us compete on a value agenda, not a cost reduction agenda, this conversation for me is developing the equivalent of a strategic plug-in. I would like us to get our act together around emotion management and plug it into the enterprise CS, CX strategy. Yeah, we've turned up before they have on emotion management, is what I'm saying. Okay, rather than wait for the knock, knock, knock on the door from the central CX team. I think it's a bit pathetic. They did the journey mapping, that's cool. This time around, we're gonna get there before them, okay? So, let's get into the conversation that a lot of us are having. Uh, again, we referred to it uh, in the previous presentation, omni-channel, multi-channel, choice, whatever you want. Fact of the matter is, if you can just see through the, the fade there, five generations of customer, different situations, drives the expectation that I have choice of how I engage with you. That remains fundamentally important if you're going to deliver what customers want at the end of the day. And you've got voice, you've got text, you've got video. 
You've got a whole ways in which they're going to access it. You know, I don't know that chandelier is connected to anything yet, but one day soon, I will probably be talking and having an emotional relationship with a chandelier. Who knows? But anyway, the world is connecting in most extraordinary ways. And you've got to kind of make some sense of it. So one of the things I talk a lot about now is what's the kind of the service design principles that drive this? Just because there's a new technology doesn't mean you should buy it. That's absolutely the best reason never to buy tech, just because it's been made available or because it's cheaper. You know, do you know why you're going to buy messaging? Well, the answer is because everyone else is doing it. That's a really bad reason for doing messaging. You need to understand it in the context of the journey, in the context of those five generations of customer. And as a rule of thumb, then this is not a bad way of thinking about life. You know, increasingly the AI, the machine learning part of it, sees patterns, which means it can predict. One of the interesting things about our contact center environment is how much data we generate versus how much we manage to extract. I would say it's about 0. Point something percent. It's pathetic. Yeah, your QA effort gets you 0. 0.2 percent. Are you telling me that's an effective way to manage quality if you just think about it? No, it's not. So what we need is technology to scale our ability to get value from the data we generate. And there's only three relationships going on, the topic, the customer, and the form of delivery. And that relationship throws up all sorts of patterns, and we need to understand more about that. If you understand more about that, you can be predictive by saying at certain points in customer journeys, customers need this, why do they have to make contact? We should be anticipating that. So that's what all that's about, that's due to grow. The other thing is the self-service we've talked about. And by the way, as a customer, I, I'm, I'm really comfortable connecting to humans and I'm really comfortable you're a brand that makes that access available to me. But equally, I don't want to be in a queue because that's the price of access, even with good routing and triage, by understanding your customer intent off of a page straight through. I still don't want to do that. You know, some people don't do voice because they only do messaging because one consumes my full attention for a certain generation, the other allows me to multitask. Fact is, this world, our attention is stretched way for thin. We're very picky about who consumes it at the end of the day. So part of Omnichannel is being sensitive to that particular decision and allowing customers to choose what they can do in terms of education, what they can do in terms of information, and what they can do in task completion. You can do a certain amount this year which, by the way, bears little relationship to what's claimed. Next year it will be different, and after that it will be different. And you as customers will have had new experiences which will cross-pollinate into different markets, so you'll have higher expectations at the end of the day. But even when it is absolutely smart as whatever you need it to be, something goes wrong. Banking, online banking, pretty mature. That works, you know how to do that, that's dead simple. However, what happens when you go into that account and you've got minus 5,000 rather than plus 5,000? <laughs> do you want another bit of self-serve? Hell you do. You want to emote to somebody and say, where's my money? You know? TSB will tell you about that. So, always important that when you actually recreate the human delivery of customer service in a way that does fit the customer expectation, you always plumb it in so it feeds straight back into the live environment with context and with intent. I do not wish to re repeat myself as a result of that. And in fact, we're headed for a world where I think virtual me and real me will be a tag team. The best version of AI says we're augmenting and replacing bits of, we're not getting rid of whole jobs at the end of the day. So intelligent-wise, it's a dovetailing of those two universes. And then we've got humans. Now this is the bit that really doesn't go, even with some of the clever, smart stuff that happens with emotive.ai, right? You've still got the chemistry of humans talking to humans around of when it's emotional, when it's complex, and when it matters to the relationship. What percentage of that should be is your business. By the way, if you have lousy service journeys, it will be higher than it needs to be because you make me feel upset because it's complicated. That's a poor use of humans. By the way, middle ground, don't, get dumb, don't do dumb things to your employees, getting them to do low-level stuff. Yeah, Hand that off so they can concentrate on the really valuable stuff. Now, that's very, very important in terms of the value proposition because then you've got a group of people focused upon adding value, changing the emotion 
state of the customer, changing their behavior and orientation towards the brand, and pivoting them towards greater commercial value. That's a good place from which to argue for more budget. I've spent 30 years living in industry where we grub around for another goddamn chat license. Yeah? Marketing sells this enormous concept called branding, gets gazillions, and it has a police force. Figure that. So, at the end of the day, it's about this. Because as human beings, the way we remember and recall stuff, you know, smell something, see something, ah, oh, I haven't thought about that for years. How did that happen? Because it's triggered through an emotion at the end of the day. It's a well-known phrase, that, but it's a great phrase. All part of your orientation towards arguing for this. So if we tend to remember the way that we feel, why is that? Well, it's because, you know, we don't have the availability of conscious attention to consciously absorb everything. Can you hear that hum? Vaguely? Yeah, you weren't before, though, were you? Precisely. So what happens is we have a certain amount of attention which we devote to things we hear. Right now you're using that to listen to this stuff because it, it might even be new. But you didn't think about getting dressed, getting up here, yeah, sitting down, having a cup of coffee. That's all learnt behavior. That's sitting underneath the conscious level. That's how we get through in life. So when you're listening and in the engagement between a customer and an advisor, what is happening is the customer is only siphoning off the bits that kind of are easy to get and remember. And it tends to be the outliers, the distinctive bits, the beginning, the end, the top, the bottom, the outliers at the end of the day, peak end rule. And what we're trying to do as a result of that is land one of those positive experiences. That's the kind of the chemistry at the end of the day. Now, the trouble with that, of course, is that it's weighted towards negativity. Yeah? It's not because I'm feeling depressed about the human race, it's just the way that we are wired Yes, and because of that, our orientation towards seeing the negative, because that comes from a certain part of our brain, the oldest bit, the reptile brain, that's the bit that is all about fight, flight, or freeze, and that, that, that's the bit that says, is this a threat? And therefore, it's very important in our work to tidy up that, because call centers are not celebration zones. You don't wake up to go, hey, it's such a fabulous day, I'm going to phone a call center, and celebrate my excitement. You don't do that. What you do is you phone a center because you've got a problem. So therefore, it's orientated towards this world, by definition. Right, a little bit of fun psychology just to, just to get into this. Have you ever wondered why it is like that? Well, one of the reasons is quite simple. If you look at the way that we work, what happens is that when we go into a, a negative space, you're a customer, you're upset, it didn't happen, you're on the phone, right? What has happened is that you're accessing that fight, flight, freeze part of your brain. That's the reptile brain sat in the middle, right? You only have a couple of options. It closes down the rest of your brain. You don't have access to being cool and who you think you are. You've just gone into survival mode at that particular point, and it releases a chemical to trigger you to do that. Cortisol, at the end of the day. It locks down the brain, we get stuck in a point of view, or we're no longer open to influence. Now, this is why actually it's really good to get into this part of the discussion, to allow the advisor to know that's what you're dealing with. You're not dealing with an open human being at the end of a wonderful meal and evening together where you're in total rapport. In fact, I don't even need to talk. I'm on your wavelength, hardly. You're in a world where that person is fundamentally suspicious about you, yes? It's me versus you. How many times does the brand insult me? We get hypersensitive. How many times do we talk about what a great experience versus, do you know what they did to me in that call center today? Yeah, it's weighted towards that particular point of view. And by the way, we're more reactive, we're more sensitive. I could be talking about your teenage daughter here, by the way, your teenage son here. Yeah, we often perceive greater judgment and negativity than actually exist. This is just as much a conversation, by the way, as employees as it is about customers. I hope you made, you noticed that point. And by the way, the bad news is this stuff lasts for over a day sitting in the body, that chemical reaction, it imprints the interaction on our memory, magnifies the impact it has on our future behavior. For me, that just perfectly, perfectly illustrates Trump at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you know? He's got tons of that stuff flowing through his system. And it functions like a sustained release tablet. The more we get worked up, the longer the impact. Now, isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? 
at the end of the day. So that is why the odds are stacked against us. So those people that do a great tick in the box, I finished in 13 seconds, which is on average how long I should spend on that particular thing. But you know, the emotional component, whew, totally missed me. I nailed the functional, missed the emotional. You've missed a very important part of that whole interaction at the end of the day. So therefore, we should be looking at, how do I transform an angry customer to a happy one? You know, what about uh, feeling stressed to feeling relieved? Oh, a lot of us are stressed. It's called living in a digital economy, right? We inherit that as soon as we start to engage with customers. How do we take people from, oh, not another product, how boring is that? Yeah, to being really excited <laughs> about that particular thing. And by the way, feeling insulted in a multicultural world, very easy to get that wrong, very easy to know what matters to an individual. Have you violated those protocols? And if you have, how do you get them to a place where they feel respected? Many, many complaints that end up in formal complaints are, are a root cause I didn't feel listened to. I didn't feel you understood me. I didn't feel you took me seriously. I've escalated it to a point of volcanic eruption, you know, because I'm fundamentally insulted by that. It happens lots. So this is the trade that we're in. You know, we've got outcomes, but we've also got this emotional landscape that we're trying to navigate. So therefore, what is this game? This game is very simple. It's about optimizing. Notice the language. That's all it can be about. Optimizing the way the customer feels during and at the end of that interaction, because that lands the memory. That lands the memory. So practically, what does this mean? If you're lucky enough that you've got somebody coming in a positive space, amplify it. And I'll tell you why. There's some good chemicals on that side of the equation too and steer a path from negative to appropriately positive. Notice I didn't give you examples of going, yes, I am so excited. Now I've interacted with you. That's very unlikely. You might get that onboarding. You might get it, for example, if you give away a ton of free stuff. <laughs> but moving from a point of view of being upset, you're gonna to move to something like, I don't know, less irritated. That's a little bit too in the middle-ish. But you know what I mean? It's going to be an appropriate positive state at the end of the day. So let me give you an example. Here is a positive uh, transformation. This lady I love, her name is Sarah Steely-Smith. She's American. She used to work from ICMI. Uh, her Twitter handle is Badass Unicorn, if that gives you an indication of Sarah's mindset uh, and approach to life. Southwest Air, by the way had a very good, I think they still do, a great reputation around of social. And this is one of the examples I use for social customer service. Um, and, and notice, um, strictly speaking, a, as a service person, do you need to respond to that? You know, there's no real need in there. It's a kind of celebration. Notice hashtag hot husband. Yeah. Frequently gets mentioned, by the way. I've never met the man, but he's, she, he frequently uh, features in her, in her tweets. Anyway, that's what she did. Now, because they're a great brand, they listened, they got it. This is how they responded. <laughs> so by implication, great emotion management at the advisor level is a certain culture. You can't put that in the rule book. But because they listened in the moment, the appropriate response came through and flowed out at the same time. That's another interesting thing about the quality of the profile of people that you're dealing with. And by the way, what's happening behind the scenes at a chemical level is this. What happens is that you catalyze another chemical reaction. This time it's oxytocin that turns out. It's often called the love hormone, okay? And that drives things like communicate, collaborate, trust. Hey, isn't that kind of useful if you're trying to negotiate with a customer? And it belongs to the more modern part of the brain, which is the frontal cortex uh, at the end of the day. Interesting, quick little point, by the way, little reptile brain. Theory goes, why did our brains get bigger than everybody else's? Interesting theory. Because we discovered fire, we could cook food. Because we could cook food, we could digest food faster. Therefore, we didn't need so much energy spent digesting. We reallocated that energy towards growing something called the prefrontal cortex. True or not, it's a nice theory. Yeah? I like that one. I like that one. So anyway, that part is to do with the social part of our being sphere, as opposed to the fight-flight response part. So the transition is a real one, not just in terms of you know, behavior, 
but actually what the brain is doing in terms of the bit that's active and the chemicals that have been released as far as that's concerned. It generates the perfect mindset to allow us to collaboratively explore ideas with customers as a trusted source of advice. So what we're looking to do here is taking those negative things, obviously getting people trained to be able to, with acuity, sense what they are, and from a measurement point of view, be able to you know, identify them, and then have a journey that takes you from that to a positive one. Now, notice they're wiggly paths. You know, notice they don't instantly go from green to purple. They're a blend, they're a mix. And that's the talent that humans bring to the party. Some have no talent in it. Yeah, they are emotionally autistic and they shouldn't be in the job. But others are great at it. And are culturally diverse in that point too. And by the way, I think that's a heck of a skill, wouldn't you agree? And by the way, wouldn't it be great to train people up to do that and then pass them on to the rest of the organization and have them as managers? There's still a lot of lousy managers out there that don't get humans. And they'd up your value again. In fact, when we were, I was building call centers in the 80s, we insisted on it before it got rubbished in the 90s and the, and the noughties as it scaled and went offshore as cost. It used to be about value. Interestingly, we paid more in those days proportionally than we do today. Another interesting point. Anyway, that's the thing. That's the game plan that you do. Okay, got the idea? How good are we? Good news is, we're crap. <laughs> Piece of survey work I did in the summer. You, representative service leaders, ask the question, do you know anyone out there that does it well online or in the contact center? Ooh, can't think of anyone. There were a few names, but actually, when, the, when they gave the descriptions, it wasn't really, in my view, emotion management. It was the fact they were good brands which is a different thing. So, you know, a delivered promise. The promise was strong, the delivery wasn't so much. Anyway, huge opportunity, going back to my first slide, no one's doing it, source of differentiation, there's the evidence, get in there first. By the way, if you want to have another piece of evidence for that, there's a US view from Bruce Temkin saying, of the three things that make up an experience, the outcome, the amount of effort, and the emotion associated, the greatest progress is made on the more practical functional areas, the least proficient area still remains emotion. So this is my point. I think there's a, a, a transition to be made from, yes, I get it, you have got some individuals who are great at doing it, you're lucky, but you don't know how they're doing it, you don't know when they're doing it, and you've no overview or oversight on the fact that of that many interactions you had this week, what proportion ended up in which positive emotions, which didn't, and why? And was that a result of the journey? Was that a result of the individual? Have you nudged them towards better goodwill, less goodwill? What have you done in terms of the brand's equity this week? I think we should know about that at the end of the day. So I'm suggesting we need to scale this as a leadership competency. And put very simply, you start off by choosing the journeys that have got a high emotional, you know, complex quotient in them because that's where the humans are gonna be mainly involved. You go through the business of looking at those journeys in detail and making sure that you've mapped and understand the, the chemistry of that journey and what you're attempting to achieve. You know, the, the primary, is there a typical emotion associated? Where are we gonna take it to? You're then gonna try and evidence that through VOC work uh, at the end of the day. And notice, by the way, VOC is never a single silver bullet. Never rely on a single source of the truth. Always looked at multiple points for that. And then you do that pathway work. You know, you figure it out and you've got test and learn and agile and all the rest of the stuff in order to be able to develop the competencies. Where it gets interesting is how is it different on modalities? You know, voice is still the most single powerful non-physical version of communication. It's amazing. I said to a, a, a group this morning, it still blows me away. In a gap, I can still sense if that advisor is engaged with me or bored. Now that's happening over noughts and ones, digitally speaking. By the way, anyone that says voice isn't digital, just diss them at the technology level and say it bloody well is. So your divide between voice and digital is pants, okay? It's a nonsense, and, and what Dennis talked about is the digital agenda. It's just a crappy way of looking at life, okay, at the end of the day. No, actually voice is incredibly potent. Now interesting, when you get to text, it's not. 
That's why emojis have turned up. And incidentally, that's how you can get better NPS with offshore teams, but that's another conversation. Okay, modalities, contact mix. Yeah, what about emotion management with proactive? What about, uh, you know, self-serve? What about self-serve reduced on a smartphone, but is still emotionally sensitive? Huge areas to unlock. Then, by the way, ongoing tracking. Did he get there? What was the gap? No, 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 no. All that kind of good stuff. If it's to do with the journey, uh, agile, DevOps improvement, blah, blah, blah. If it's to do with humans, coaching. Make sure your team leader's worth the, worth the salt. And then, of course, set it up to evidence the transformation in terms of the numbers. That's roughly speaking the workflow that you're doing. In terms of the planning framework, there's only four questions. What is it? How does it work? Who does what? What changes? This is the embedding process. And put simply, there are four things that we need to talk through, which is clarity on the focus, the benefits, that formula I was talking about. How does it work in journeys, the contact mix, making it happen, etc. What does it do on the people front? Who does what? And then the changes in terms of the core capabilities. And the reason for doing that is with any change, you need to make sure everything is aligned to support the change. If you have conflict in the ecosystem, it's gonna fight against it. That's really, in essence, what we're talking about there. So again, you start to see changes of behavior with individuals. That's what the, uh, the advisor is doing in the future. Think about the profile of the people for that. Let's go up a level, and I think equally fascinating is the impact it has on team leaders, particularly the last point. Own the responsibility for nurturing emotionally engaged employees as a key enabler of emotionally engaged customers. Ha, ha, ha. That's the team leader we're talking about, looking at a wall board, getting the three people in the queue. Dead interesting. So, by the way, in your doggy bags, that whole conversation is written out in a little bit more of a long form format. Uh, it's been written out in order for you to plonk it on somebody's desk and say, this is what we're doing next. Read it, be enlightened, and give me budget. And for the rest of you, come along early next year because we are going to be doing uh, workshops. And we're going to have a workshop in each of those four quadrants. And we're going to figure it out and crowdsource it and be the first mob who are doing emotion management in contact centers. So that's the mission. If you want to come along, I'd love to see you there. Thank you for your attention. We're done. Thank you.